بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله عليه أفضل الصلاة وتم تسليم أما بعد <coughs> الله سبحانه وتعالى يسر نزبوك يا أيها الذين آمنوا خوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة You with me? You guys can hear me? Where's the kids at? Allah, he said in the Quran, O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a hellfire whose fuel is men and stones. How a person saves their self and their family from the hellfire is by learning their religion and having good character. As one of the companions, Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, Ay, allimuhum wa addibuhum. He said, meaning teach them knowledge and teach them character. Teach them knowledge and make sure that they have good character. So that's my advice, my very, very short advice before you start bombarding me with questions. For all the kids, we say to you what was stated by one of the Salaf when he said, Kunna asagira qawm. And we were the youngest of the people, and now we are old. And today you are the youngest of the people, and tomorrow you're going to grow up. So understand your religion before you are given responsibility. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. How old are you, Sheikh? Yes. I have the brother advised that give a short advice about about music and singing and so on and so forth. As for music is concerned, some of the scholars in the past, they used to call music the voice of shaitan. They used to call music the voice of shaitan. And that is because what is mentioned in music is everything that is hated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a Muslim, what, what, what are the things that a Muslim cannot do? <laughs> you definitely can't dance. <laughs> what else? Sing. Sing. Besides things connected to music, what can't a Muslim do? Huh? A Muslim can't date, a Muslim can't drink, a Muslim can't what? Can't fornicate, can't? He cannot steal. Hmm? Can't do drugs. Can't lie, he can't commit adultery, he can't... Huh? He can't eat pork. And all those people who sing do all of those things. Right? All those people who sing do all of those things or most of those things. So if you listen to a people who do those things and they're talking about doing those things and you know that those are things that a Muslim doesn't do and they're encouraging you to do those things, then how can you justify that? How could you think that that's something that's correct for you to do? Tell you another thing that's important And it's a really serious issue. And sometimes when kids get to a certain age, they don't really understand this issue or their parents don't teach them this issue correctly. And when a child gets to the age of what is called tamyiz, right? Tamyiz is where he can recognize that girls are pretty. Right? Or a boy, he can recognize that girls are pretty. And girls look good. Right? And he starts to get shy around girls and so on and so forth. At that age, right, and likewise the same age for the girls, when they start to recognize the boys and like that, at that age, where little boys start finding themselves attractive to little, attracted to little girls, and little girls find, them, find themselves attracted to boys, 
They cannot be around each other like that anymore if they're not related. Right? And this is something that's a big problem in our communities, especially for the kids that go to public schools or go to schools that are run by people who are not practicing the sunnah correctly. The point that you find Muslim boys and Muslim girls all the way to their teenage years talking about their friends and talking to each other on the phone or talking to each other in the streets or talking to each other in the classroom and so on and so forth. And this is something that's very dangerous because it leads to all sort of destruction. It leads to all sort of harms. It leads the people to falling into things that are hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point that one of the scholars he said that the cause of the destruction of entire countries and entire societies has been an account of al-ikhtilat, al-muharram, has been an account of forbidden free mixing between the sexes. So you, Shaytani. I had I had a long advice. I you know I didn't know I was it was a Q and A session. I could have, you know. Go ahead. So now. How do you advise brothers that who know the who know that mingling with the sex is not allowed, and they know the punishment behind it, but they give you the reason that they say they can't stay away from the opposite sex because of the desire they have, and that. We say that's a weak excuse. The brother, he asked a question. He said, what about people who know that mingling or mingling or mixing with people of the opposite gender, and he, boys mixing with girls, and girls mixing with boys that aren't their relatives, and he directly related to them, not their cousins, and he, but their, and he, their mothers or their aunties, or their sisters are like that. He said some people, they have the excuse to say that. One more time. We say they have desires and it's too hard to stay away from them. We say that's a person admitting that they're weak. Who, who wants to be known to be weak? Especially a man. Especially a boy who's trying to grow into a man. Right? You just admitted that you're weak. If you say that, you can't stay away from the opposite sex like that. Because you're too weak. You're admitting weakness. Who wants to be weak? When is weak ever a praiseworthy thing? And this is something that's contrary to dignity. It's contrary to the religion. And, and the person he should remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees him and he should be shy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he should be shy of Allah if the imam of the masjid or one of the brothers from the idara or your Quran teacher walked past you while you were talking to a girl right what would you do don't answer <laughs> but think if you're a person that does that, what would you do if the imam or somebody respectable in the community or your Quran teacher, if they saw you talking to a girl? You would act like you weren't talking to her, you would probably walk the other way, you would you would be embarrassed, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. The imam of the masjid, he doesn't have control over paradise or hellfire for you. Right? He doesn't have control over your money and your life and your death and your organs and your body and so on and so forth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has power over everything, He sees you. And this should make you afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else? Can you pray with your hands on your sides instead of Across your chest, right? Right here? No. Folk. Above or below? Below? There are some narrations that said that the Prophet did that, but none of them are authentic. And we don't know that the Prophet did that, and what is most authentic, the scholars say, is to pray with your hands and your chest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and, and this is is the issue that there's a lot of difference about. But I would advise you to pray with your hands and your chest. I have a question. 
Ja. Ja. And what the sin would definitely go on the sheikh and and the boy and the young boy he should try his best to learn the sunnah of the Prophet I mean, and if he knows that there are people who do that right and who bring things to the religion that aren't from it he should stay away from those people and he shouldn't any, anything that they say he should ask somebody who has knowledge to make sure that what they're saying is correct if they advise him or something he shouldn't just say you know I've, I've seen some Muslim kids that, you know, any time a person who is upon innovation, whether it's a school teacher or anything else, tells them something, they don't believe it, <laughs> even if it's right. right. Even if it's right, they don't believe it. Right. So you shouldn't say that what you're saying is wrong automatically, but you should check with somebody who knows, or you should ask them their proof. You should ask them why. Right. If somebody tells you something and you have a doubt about it, you should ask them why. But in general, you shouldn't. You should try to stay away from those sorts of people to the best of your ability. But you don't know if it's right or wrong. Well, then what do you do? You don't do anything. You don't act upon what they say. If you don't know that it's from the religion, you know, that you, you push the pause button until you find that it's from the religion, right? The scholars of Islam, they say, as Ibn Qayyim, he mentions in some of his books, that aladha, enjoying something, it comes as a result of loving something. Enjoying something comes as a result of loving something. Right? And loving something comes as a result of knowing about the beauty of that thing and how it benefits you right? so the key to being excited about the religion is knowledge the key to being excited about the religion is knowledge the more you know about the beauty of the religion and how the religion benefits you the more you love the religion the more you love the religion the more you enjoy doing everything that you do okay? <coughs> Alhamdulillah, my learning the Arabic language and what I have learned of it is from the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is also from the hasanat of my brothers in the different cities that I lived in and the people in this community and when you find yourself in a community that's very diverse and you have a lot of people around you who have the ability to speak Arabic you should take advantage of that opportunity Alhamdulillah I've been a Muslim for almost 11 years and as soon as I became Muslim I immediately got out of my negative environment and I started to live with some brothers who were upon the Sunnah and who were Arabs. And I started to learn from them what I could learn from them. And I had tutors. And I saw that the key to understanding the religion was knowledge. And the key to knowledge, or the key to benefiting from the religion was knowledge. And the key to knowledge is the Arabic language. And in particular, I will tell, I'll tell you a story, and it's an important story, especially for right now. And it's an important story for right now because of what happened a couple of days ago in Oregon. And we all know about this, and it's important from our masajid, from the masajid of the Salafiyin and Ahl Sunnah, 
with the Muslims that we talk about these things, right? Everybody knows what happened in Oregon. There was a boy who drove a van full of what he thought were explosives, and he wanted to kill some non-Muslim people. There was a person in my city who has some of these types of beliefs. And after having these beliefs for some time, he went crazy. But before he went all the way crazy, when he was only half, half the way crazy, and I was a new Muslim, he tried to poison me with his innovation. And I had roommates who were Arabs, and I had the opportunity to sit with some of the mashaykh. And he, when I was a Muslim for only a few months, and I was around brothers like our brother Abu Wais, rahimahullah ta'ala, and other brothers who are influential people in the da'wah, and in their different cities who are the imams and masajid and so on and so forth. And these brothers, they gave me a lot of advice. And I had questions I would ask them about these questions. And I had a lot of doubts about some of the things that this person was telling me. And it really hurt my heart because everything that he said, he had a verse from the Quran to try to justify it. And he would take a verse from the Quran or a hadith from the Prophet some, and he would put his own spin on it. And he would spin it, and I would be spinning with it. Right? Along with that, I had, before that, I had found myself. Okay. Before that, I had found myself on a couple of occasions with the Jama'atul Tablir. The Jama'atul Tablir. And I was a brand new Muslim, and some of the things I heard from them really bothered me. For example, there was one man who he told a story when we were in the masjid and he was having his lesson reading from whatever he was reading from, Hayatul Sahaba, or whatever book he was reading from. And he said that on one occasion, Omar, he drank some milk. He said, Omar, he drank some milk and immediately he vomited the milk, right? I don't know the authenticity of this story, but what he said after that was kufr. What he said after that was kufr. He said, after Omar, he spit up the milk and vomited the milk, he said, where did this milk come from? And they said that was from the milk, first, that was from the milk that's given in sadaqah. And he said, do you know why Omar threw up that milk? He said, because Allah was in the milk. And I said, I was a brand new Muslim, but I said, this guy doesn't know what's coming out of his face. <laughs> Who would say a statement like that? And so I started to see, along with the fact that in the city that I lived in, that outside of our brother Abu Ways, rahimahullah ta'ala, and who we would see on a time-to-time -time basis, and we would send his classes and so on and so forth, that a lot of the brothers that I was coming across in that city and different cities have been Muslim for a very long time, but really didn't know a whole lot about Islam. And they reminded me of the Christians before I was a Muslim and how people just believe something and didn't know why they believed it. They didn't know what they believed. And they were easily dupable. They were easily trickable. And so with these sorts of things combined along with the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time that I was confused about some issues about terrorism and so on and so forth for a very short period of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He blessed us with a visit to the United States from some of the people of Ahlul Sunnah at that time, and who came from other countries, and also, and he from the Mashaykh, and also our brothers from Salafi Publications in Birmingham, England. And they spoke in a lot of detail about the things that I was confused about, and I was very grateful to them. And I'm still very grateful to them today. And I saw that they had proof and evidence in Arabic. And I had, at that time, I had learned a little bit of Arabic. And as a matter of fact, when I became Muslim, I had already learned the Arabic alphabet before taking my Shahada. 
And I started to realize at that point how important it was to learn the Arabic language. And I had a good friend of mine who lives in Egypt now. May Allah reward him and preserve him. We were at the, when we were at the program, he bought a large Arabic library. He spent about $300 on books. And he was on his way back to Egypt, and he left all of those books with me. And in the few months before he went back, we sat with those books, and we would just read. And he would make me read to him, and he would say, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I had the dictionary, and I would go through things. And I spent a lot of time with the Arab brothers, and I picked up a lot of vocabulary from them, or say a good amount of vocabulary from them. But I think it was the understanding that to protect yourself from things that are very dangerous to your religion, it's very important to have knowledge. And in order to have the shortcut to knowledge, instead of always waiting for a translator, that you should learn the Arabic language. Right? That's the long answer. <laughs> How long have I spent overseas? I've been to Canada a couple of times. I said that's across the that's across the lake, right? <laughs> uh, alhamdulillah, you know, for some for some time, for different reasons, I was prevented from traveling, and for many different reasons. Alhamdulillah, and I had you know made plans on various occasions and opportunities came up on various occasions to go overseas but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever reason and he hadn't decreed that for me and alhamdulillah I was uh, allowed to obtain the ability to travel a couple of years ago and for the first time I went to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia for three weeks alhamdulillah for an Umrah trip and that's the length of time I spent overseas physically but other than that as we translated last year, the year before, in this masjid for the Shaykh Mus'ad al Husseini. The Shaykh, he said, for those who cannot go, there's so much available for you. There's so much available for you. Lai as Shaykh Zayd al Merkhali almost every night, he teaches live in the Arabic language. And a Roman, the Belux Messenger, and the Shaykh, they have durus and dorat over the internet and there's so much that a person can benefit from without leaving this country and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his beautiful names and his lofty attributes to allow me to take that next step inshallah and travel out of this country and seek knowledge at the hands of the ulama of Ahl sunnah say ameen Okay. Somebody asked a question Can you put the Holy Quran on the floor? You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Not every issue do we have to necessarily identify is this thing haram or is it mandatory? And the Prophet ﷺ forbade the people from doing something, for example. They want to say, is this makru or is it haram? If you told us not to do it. Not to say that the Prophet Sallallahu ever told us not to put the Quran on the floor. But rather, the Quran is something that is honorable and it's something noble. And the ulama of Islam, like Imam Anawi and others, they mention that any even books of knowledge, they shouldn't be left on the floor. Because if you leave a book on the floor, it may be kicked, so on and so forth. It's not... And it's not good to place them on the floor. He said, likewise, you shouldn't use the Quran or any other book of knowledge for a pillow. Right? For those people who go to sleep reading. Right? Since interacting and touching Ajnabi is haram, can a Muslim man or woman be a doctor? And the situation of a doctor is a situation of necessity. And so the ulama, they say that, of course, these things are needed to have doctors and so on and so forth. It depends what type of doctor they want to be. Um, and Allah knows best. 
I'm not answering that. Anzar. <laughs> Khalifa. I heard it is not good to listen to Nasheed songs or Islamic songs with only drums. But if the ones who sing it have positive messages and they follow the sunnah, if they follow the sunnah, they wouldn't be singing Nasheed. Shouldn't it, should it not be considered equal or normal to songs made by non-Muslims? I don't know. Should it not be considered equal or normal to songs made by non-Muslims? Hold on one second. And she's saying it shouldn't be considered to be equal or normal to songs made by non-Muslims. There's a beautiful statement by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Utaymi rahimahullah ta'ala in his fatawa. He mentions that the person who develops within themselves a love of certain things that have no basis in the sunnah, that they'll find that those things are from the sunnah that they should be involved in that they will start to dislike those things or not have the same amount of love for those things. He said, for example, there are some people who visit what they call mashahid, the shrines or masajid built over graves. He said, these people, they find more pleasure in visiting these graves than going to the Kaaba. To the point that some of them in Senegal and Toba and they have a belief that if any the sheikh of their village or whatever, if he makes the hajj, that the hajj is fardun kifaya. Some of them, they say this, and not all of them. They say that the hajj, and it's a community obligation, and so they don't have to make the hajj because somebody else in their community already made the hajj. But every year they come in the millions to the grave of Mamadou Bamba. Right? And they make a prayer facing the Atlantic Ocean, because they say that's where Mamadou Bamba, huh? that's where they said that he made a salat on a prayer rug that was on top of the water. Right? Said that he was in chains and he slipped out of his chains. Said he was a wali, he was a saint or whatever. And he slipped out of his chains and he made a prayer on the water. And so they have this innovative prayer that they do. You see the people, they go to the grave of Fatima, they go to the grave of Bedouin, they go to these. The point is that they find more pleasure in these innovated acts than they do in what is from the religion. Likewise, he said, people who listen to what are now called Nasheed. In those days, they were called something else, but now these days are called Nasheed. He said, these, these same people, they don't find that amount of pleasure that they find from listening to Nasheed, they don't find that same amount of pleasure in listening to the Qur'an or listening to the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the religion, it becomes entertainment to them. And that's why Shaykh Uthameen and others, they said that the Nasheed are like the hymns of the Christians, the songs in the churches that are sung by the Christians. And there's no basis in Islam for them. And... For this reason, the ulama of our time, they have said that al-anashid, and that are called al-islamiyah, that are called Islamic nasheed, that they are not permissible. Can we listen to nasheed that are Allah's names? This is like almost like the... um. This reminds me rather of a question that I was asked, you know, by some people in my city, and they wanted to know what was wrong with Islamic rap. And I said, well, you might as well be a regular rapper, because if you're a regular rapper, you're a fasik. But you're, if you're an Islamic rapper, you're a mubtadia. You're an innovator. And an innovator is, work, is worse than a sinful person. Because the person who is sinning, he knows that what he's doing is wrong. While the person who's doing the innovation, he thinks that he's doing something good and benefiting the people and getting close to Allah by what he's doing. So, well, one second. So the question says, can we listen to the nasheed that are Allah's names? So you have a nasheed, and I've 
I don't listen to Nasheed, but I've heard a Nasheed that was similar to that on one occasion. It was just Allah, Allah, like that. What's the point? Why? Why you want to listen to a Nasheed that's, you know, mentioning the names of Allah, so on and so forth? You could just make dhikr. You know, the ulama when they weren't teaching and busy with their classes and so on and so forth, they always make dhikr. Always remembering Allah subhanahu alhamdulillah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Kalimatan, Kalimatan khafifatani ala lisan, thaqilatani fil mizan, habibatani ala rahman, subhanallah wa bihamdihi wa subhanallah al azim. There are two statements that you can say that are light on the tongue, heavy in your scales on the day of judgment. And love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, to say subhanallah wa bihamdihi wa subhanallah al azim. So you could send salat and salam on the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. There are many things that a person can do. And he, well, why sit around and listen to Nasheed, mentioning Allah's names over and over again or anything else? And if a person wants to soften their heart, can you soften their heart? Can you soften your heart with something that the companions never soften their hearts with? You're going to make your heart softer than the hearts of the companions? You have a way that's better than their way? What they did, it wasn't enough to soften your heart. I mean, that's that's silly, right? Okay, go ahead. The difference between poetry and a sheet is is very clear. Huh? Do you want me to recite some poetry and then recite some in the sheet so you can see a difference? <laughs> poetry. Particularly Arab Arab poetry, mandumat and qasaid and so on and so forth. They have awzan, they have any different ways that they put together, right? And that are very distinct from nasheed. And nasheed is usually malori and so on and so forth. It's, it's much different. It doesn't have any style from the known styles of the Arab. And that's how we know because they don't have the styles of the Arab poetry. And the Arabs have a rich history of poetry, right? that this was something that was innovated. And that's how we know that it was something that was innovated, imitating the non-Arab, non-Muslim peoples. A lot of people, they became Muslim from other lands, and they started to bring these things in. Right? So these things are much different than that. You know, also, you know, some of the mashaykh, I've, I've heard in different lectures, some of the mashaykh, they dislike, you know, when you have sometimes they're studying like a manduma, right? And you find the person, they, they usually have one of their students recite for them. And sometimes they'll do it right? Like this, you know. Start getting real melodious. And they say, you know, that's <laughs> That's enough, you know. Now, some of them, they're not even reciting a manduma. They may, maybe just reading from a book and they're still doing like this, up and down and low and high and like this. And you hear, hear many of the mashayikh, they say there's no also for that. It's, and he says, you know, it causes tashwish. It, you know, busies the mind of a person and confuses him. It's not any benefit in that. So even with that, you know, you know, to, you know, to, to say things in a nice way and then to, then to overdo it, there's a, there's a line in between the two and Allah knows best. The process of Gosul? The process of Gosul, we know the process of Gosul is that the person that they begin by making the wudu, right? And then they and he put water over the entirety of their body, and he, very quickly they put water over the entirety of their body. And some of the ulama, they say that the last thing that you do and he is the washing of the feet, right? The washing of the feet, and they say the person he starts with the right side to the left side. And then the last thing they do is washing the feet, and, and he, some narrations have been reported that it's better to wash the feet outside of the place where the person makes gusul. Right? And it's important that the water covers every part of the body, meaning the armpits, the unmentionable places, right? That a person that they, and just like sometimes a person may make wudu, right? Sometimes a person may make wudu and see that there's a spot on his elbow or a spot on his arm. Right? That didn't get wet. So if that's the case with wudu, right? Then what about ghusl? 
right? So you have to really look. But that's probably not a problem for a lot of people because most people probably use 50 gallons of water <laughs> to take gusel, you know. And it's just something that, that you know, is something that people struggle with and, 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 he, so, and that we should try to try our best not to waste water. Okay. What, can you start again? I didn't hear you. I know, I know about touching the private parts. What uh-huh. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The scholars say, and he has Shaykh Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, and he has a position that has some strength behind it that says that the touching the private parts that breaks the wudu, that is that which is done any, with desire or done any, like intentionally or so on and so forth, right? And that which is any, done in other than that fashion, you know, that it's not of the same nature. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, and the <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Allah knows best. Tayyib. If there's a imam who's upon innovation and the people are talking about him, is that backbiting or not? The reason, the only reason that a person should ever be talking about that person is to warn against them, right? If they know that what he's doing is wrong and they should only do it as much as possible. I mean, as much as needed, as much as possible, <laughs> right? That's what some people do, right? Some people unnecessarily, they just sit around talking about other people and so on and so forth. We want the good for everybody. We don't want, and we're not happy that people are misguided and so on and so forth. We don't just sit around, you know, gloating over the misfortunes of others. And he, but if they're saying something because somebody has been tricked by him or somebody, and he doesn't think that there's anything wrong with listening to a person like that, and somebody wants to say, but you know, the scholars have said and our teachers have said such and such, and you know, this person, I'll give you an example, somebody like Anwar Awlaqi, right? Like Anwar Awlaqi, for years, for years, I've been telling the people that you should stay away from his tapes and his lectures. Right? And for different reasons, and he included in that was some of his political views, so on and so forth, right? right? And you see the benefit of warning against people like that now. Hmm. As for <coughs> those lines of poetry that were um, mentioned, when the Prophet Sallallahu entered Medina and everybody, and he, most people have heard them, right? Those lines of poetry that they said were, you know, recited to the, pro- to the Prophet Sallallahu when he entered Medina, that narration, the scholars have said, is not authentic. They said that's not authentic. Can we write books, poem, quote, poetry? Is it around to play any kind of sports with our cousins that are boy or girl? I mean, poetry in general is not something harmful. I and mean, it becomes harmful when it becomes something that you sing and so on and so forth. But a person, if they want to write poetry, as long as they don't make it their obsession and become obsessive, compulsive, and writing poetry and, you know, waste their time with it. And as long as the poetry contains that which is not in contradiction to the religion, then inshallah there's no problem with it. It's around to play any kind of sports with our cousins that are boys or girls. It depends on how old you are. It depends on how old you are. If you're past that age where you're not supposed to be around them, then you shouldn't be playing sports with them. One minute. I need the chair.
That's what the brother just asked. Oh. If they ask, is it permissible I mean, to, to sing and so on and so forth on the day of Eid and use the duff? This is only for the girls. It's only for the girls. Um, it's only for the females. The Prophet said, said repent, is acceptable until death reaches your jugular bone. It also said that Allah does not acceptance of those who oh, death is only 40 days away from him or her. It is also said that Allah does not accept repentance of the one who death is only 40 days away from him or her. Which one of these is right? I've never heard the second thing that you mentioned. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said that acceptance is, that, that repentance is accepted from one of you. ما لم يغرغر and, he, and as long as he hasn't started the, and the gurgling of death. Right? The sound that comes out where the person is making a moaning noise before they die, right? At that time, meaning at the moment of death, right? And that hadith was great to be authentic by Shaykh Abani. As for that, which says that Allah does not re- accept the repentance of the one who death is only 40 days away from him or her. I've never heard that in a day in my life until now. Do you know of any narrations about eating dates from the Hajj and eating seven of them while saying Bismillah for each one? No, I don't know about that. They... We have 25 seconds. Well, the first thing they should do is get their passport. The second thing they should do is save their money. And the third thing they should do is go ahead and go overseas and put the tra- the, the tawakkal on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If they take those means and, and there's just nothing that they can do, right? Or if they're busy, they have too many children, so on and so forth. And then they they benefit from what's available in their community, right? And the the method of self study it doesn't work for most people. And you should find you a tutor. You should find somebody who can teach you Arabic at least two days a week. A person's not going to learn anything if he has a class one day a week. Have at least two days a week, possibly three days a week, whatever you can do. And outside of your class with your teacher, you should be trying to learn as much as you can. You want to go back to your teacher, and if you're on lesson two, go back to him and be ready for lesson four. Right? Finish lesson four, be tested on it, and come back and be ready for lesson six if you can. You know, you want to try your hardest. The person who and he puts forth an effort, he's going to see the results. Is it a sin if we as Muslims visit the church or temple or anything like that? There's no reason for a Muslim to visit a church or a temple or anything like that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The proof on wearing your pants, but pa- your pants past your ankle. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, "Whatever is below the ankles is in the hellfire." Right, meaning that the person whose pants, as the Sheikh Zaid, he said, the person whose pants is below his ankles, he's going to be in the hellfire. Right, it's a threat, and it doesn't mean I say that 100% he's going to be in the hellfire, but he's threatened with the punishment of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. It's not a false marriage if if they meet the, each other on the internet to get married, but and to get married, but how they're going about it is entirely wrong. I and mean, because those things usually, a lot of times, and we've seen from experience that a lot of people who meet people online and so on and so forth, and they use these different websites to meet somebody who they may be interested in marrying almost I will probably say from what I've seen 
the situations I know of, probably the majority of instances, 75, 85% of instances, they never get married. And now you get all these people that, well, I decided not to marry you, but we could still be friends. That's just, I mean, it's just silliness. Is Zachariah somebody that you can rely on for answers or listen to his lectures? No and no. Is it okay to watch Peace, Peace TV? Please don't. <laughs>